Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. You're going to listen to an episode about trees and tree planting. Why we need to plant millions of trees is known to most of us, but how are we going to do that? And how we're going to choose what to plant where and why to regenerate the 2 billion hectares that are currently degraded around the world. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. Before we get started, I've been recording these interviews next to my day job and I will definitely continue to do so and release about an episode a month. But at the same time, I would love to take this further, share more interviews. There are many more stories to share on investing in regenerative food and agriculture. More depth, improve the quality, maybe even doing some video series. So I started a Patreon community, which makes it easy to support creators like myself. If these podcasts have been of value to you, and if you have the means, I invite you to support me and make this happen. For more information, please find the link to my Patreon account in the description below. And now, without further ado, the interview. Enjoy! Welcome to another episode of the podcast. I'm Koen van Seyen, and today I interview Harry, Arnaud and Koen of Land Life Company. I've interviewed the co-founder of Landlife before in the first episode of this podcast about two and a half years ago, and I will definitely link back this episode in the show notes below. I'm very happy to check in with them and see how things are evolved. And after a short check-in, we'll zoom into the question, what to plant, where and why? As Landlife Company is taking on bigger and bigger projects and reforestation projects, this question is absolutely key. This interview is recorded live in the offices of Landlife, so I'm sorry for the background noises and the not studio quality. Enjoy. To my right here, uh, very welcome both uh, the three of you, Harry, Kuhn and Arnaud. But we're going to start with Arnaud and a short introduction into the personal question I always love to ask at the beginning. What brings you to planting trees all over the world, basically? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Arnaud Ashes at Landlife. I'm responsible for the technology department. And to answer the question, for me, it was totally, I rolled into this. I was just lucky to come in contact with the concept of planting trees in dry areas. My background is not as the gentleman uh, on my right in, uh, in, in Wageningen, in arid agriculture or in forestry, but it's in business administration, after which I worked for uh, multiple corporates and through contact with one of the founders of land life company, Eduard Sane, I rolled into uh, planting trees in dry areas. So for me, it has been mostly on the job training and falling in love with traveling to all these very weird, but very interesting places and talking not in high glass buildings, but on fields with farmers and thinking about what to plant where. So totally random in my case. Thank you. And Harry, what's your, what has been your journey to this weird company? <laughs> well, that's an interesting question, but <laughs> let me first start uh, that I have a background at agricultural Wageningen, Wageningen Agriculture University, a background in tropical crop sciences. And actually I fell in love with desert climates and uh, being in desert climates, I was very intrigued to see how plants and trees are growing over there. And working at Endlife gives me the opportunity to put things into practice. And I'm very fond of that. I'm very proud of it too. And I'm working at Landlife Company as head of research and development, giving me the opportunity to work on methodologies as well as products which could advance tree growth in desert areas or especially here in drylands. And also I can make use of my economical background looking specifically to the plant physiological aspects of trees and to see how they manage under dry conditions. And in my perspective, you see trees which are spenders, you see trees which are savers, and those are the same traits you see in human people when they are facing risk, environmental risks. Super. And Kuhn, last member who joined the team recently, what has been your journey? My journey up to now. 
Well, I'm a biologist, really deciding to be a biologist at the age of eight or so, or ten, something like that, really wanted to know everything about plants and birds and insects. So I really studied biology to understand biology. Doing biology first in Groningen, then Wageningen, working on meadow birds and in estuaries and lots of different projects. And then coming to trees, and trees are really fascinating organisms, standing on a single place for centuries and having to cope with anything that goes by there. So I have very much a scientific background. I'm working now as a, as a, as a professor at Wageningen University, having done lots of research related to tree, tree functioning, forest systems, climate change, now bioeconomy, and so on. And for me, this is a very conscious decision, really to say, okay, I've been working now maybe 30 years about on a theory, very much about wind modeling and so, and now I'm thinking, okay, it is really necessary to use trees, to use forests, to sequester carbon, to, to protect biodiversity, to protect areas and soils, and to hand them over in a better state to the next generation. So, and let's say companies like this, I mean, the science and the, the government are not going to do this. That is a too lengthy, too inefficient kind of process. So you really need, let's say, a kind of can-do organization. And let's say land life is very much a can-do organization, starting communicating with businesses, getting the thing done. So that is really, really fascinating. And the next step, for me to bring, well, what I can bring in this uh, company, background in science and network and understanding of trees and trees functioning and see to get this operational, well, in this uh, surrounding. So that's my motivation. Coming back to Arnaud for a second, um, could you give us the last, <coughs> I wouldn't say two and a half year uh, download because that's quite a bit. But a, a short update where Land Life Company is uh, now, what are your main focus points that, that maybe were different, uh, let's say, three years ago? Sure. Um, just going back to the, the total beginning, uh, to stretch your question, Kuhn, um, we started focused on the cocoon, a product that we use to protect trees and to grow them in dry areas. This probably 2014 and the first half of 2015 was purely on product development. Uh, Harry and I going to the Gamma and the Praxis here in Holland to get uh, uh, stuff to improve the product. Went obviously through a lot of iterations and then started in 2015 in the second half to plant trees in the field and use the product. Many a time we've been high-fiving in Amsterdam after a lab test showed that we were either water tightness or it could handle uh, certain stresses and heat. And then in the field, obviously, you would get the in situ situation of termites eating it or goats uh, eating the tree shelter or even baboons hitting each other with a tree shelter. So we learned a lot from the field experience. Uh, as I said, we went through multiple revisions uh, of the product and we feel, I think in 2017, that we really had something that we could apply in a lot of different areas, mainly obviously focusing on dry areas. Then the last two and a half years, we really went from a product-oriented companies, basically a seller of cocoons, to a end-to-end -end reforestation uh, company. So what did that mean? That meant that we are a project uh, developer uh, from the nursery, basically from seed to the nursery, to the planting, and to all the monitoring of a project afterwards. So from a standpoint of accountability and transparency and project management, uh, Landlife has moved into that area, which is why now our clients pay us for uh, either for per hectare or per ton CO2 sequestered. So the business model really shifted from per cocoon to outcome-based yes. finance, basically. And how is how has this shift been? I mean, how difficult has it been? I think outcome-based is something many, many people in the, in the sector would love to do. Uh, what would be a tip or what, what, how has the journey been to, to switch more to those outcome-based uh, structures? Well, on the one hand, it, it's, we were lucky that on a macro level, um, I mean, and, and Kuhn can attest to this, but the 
climate has not been helping the world, which means that companies, organizations, foundations like ours have been lucky in a sense that there's a lot of policy being developed. Uh, think of the Paris Accords and think of the shipping industry or the airline industry that are now becoming more responsible for their CO2 outputs and that they need solutions. And yes, there's a, a big UN program called Red Plus, which you probably have covered many times in this podcast and other types of CO2 sequestration, but nothing on the level uh, that the world needs. And We'll get into that later, but also the, the way in which reforestation has been done is a pretty traditional industry. So it's planting trees. Obviously, the people on the ground know what species they want to use and, and they monitor to an extent, but there has been nothing on a global level, um, not a lot of science being done for the simple reason that there's not a lot of money to be made. So in agriculture, obviously, there is a return. Uh, in timber, there's a return. So there's more research and development, I would say, in those areas than there is in uh, nature restoration. And that shift is happening. And to answer your question, we've been riding that wave towards the company we're becoming and are, are planning to become on the basis that clients are interested in the outcomes and the way to get to these outcomes and to, in our case, plant at larger scale, lower cost and at speed are becoming more and more important. And, and could you explain like a key example or, or a company or a project you're, or a client you're working with or you have worked with and it's done that you could obviously share something to show that end to end? Like what, what is a, a customer, uh, what is one you would like to share to give an example of this, uh, this process, this transformation from going from cocoon to selling end to end full reforestation yep. um, projects? Good question. Uh, so our, our clients before this shift were mainly, uh, let's say, the city of Los Angeles or the Mexican government or the Spanish government. So more on the government side, both local, federal, and sometimes multinational in, in uh, UNHCR or the UN. The shift now, and as example, I'd say corporates. We work for a, a Dutch company called Leaseplan, which has uh, millions of cars around the world that they uh, lease out to clients. And they are planning to become fully electric in 2030. But they realize that before 2030, all the cars that they have on the road are going to be, um, yeah, they're going to be spending CO2. Um, they're not going to be zero emission for sure. No yeah. zero emission. <laughs> so yeah, their goal is to be in a, a fully electric in 2030. But up to that time and uh, up to that time, all the CO2 that is uh, expended, they want to sequester. So a company like that came to us and we could exactly work out what that means per car, per month, per year, or for the whole portfolio. And they wanted to plant trees and not only plant trees and sequester CO2, but also do ecosystem services, engage the local community, but also their company. So we've had two trips now to Spain where there's local managers or managers from Amsterdam coming and also planting these trees and working in that project. And they, uh, they're a client and they pay us for the amount of CO2 we sequester. And you find the land, you find the species, you find the local contractors, etc., to basically do that. Yes, and, and because that is the, the, the setup, that is also why we are engaging in a process called data-driven planting, where we basically want to plant as much trees as possible in a planting season. We want to do it at the lowest cost possible and at the lowest impact to nature. So you can imagine if you use excavators, but also people or, or pickup trucks, and you go into the land and you do tree planting, that there's a pressure on nature that you would rather do once. And that is why we are keeping the cost down and expanding the scale at which we can do this to make sure that there's also a profit for us. So there's a conscious choice that we made to become a private company. The goal is not to uh, put Ferraris in our driveways, but it is to plant Teslas. as many Teslas, <laughs> but to plant <laughs> as many trees as as possible, but to do go and engage into these contracts and, and build these machines and develop these machines that can do this at scale, uh, we, we felt it was necessary to become a private uh, company. Yeah, I think it's the, the restoration industry that you've referred to previously, but also others that hasn't really existed. I don't think there's anything been even close to data-driven planting or a a company approach to that, which could be good and bad. I mean, we can have exactly. a discussion about it, obviously, but bringing the cost down of planting and the success rate up in the gazillion trees we need to plant probably is a good thing. And what's the land like, like just in, in the example of Spain, that's been, what kind of land are you targeting in this case? 
Well, in Europe, that's mostly so. So you can imagine for tree planting, it makes sense to have a relatively level uh, piece of land, as little rocks as possible, especially if you go into the field with machinery. And in a sense, for us, that's lucky. Um, that in Europe, there's a lot of abandoned agriculture land. Uh, so a- either used for animal husbandry or agriculture. Spain is a good example. Uh, we always joke that the villages in which we plant, the youngest person is 60 or 70. And there's a lot of urbanization in Spain. A lot of uh, youth has moved to the cities to get jobs, don't want to work the fields. So that's another reason why we come in with a lot of mechanization. But these areas are very uh, much of interest to us because there's a lot of erosion going on, mainly wind erosion in in areas like Spain. They're doing nothing with the land and nature is not coming back unaided. So that's a big issue. I mean, we can debate with Kuhn probably that in 50 years or 100 years, trees will start and there will be a primary species coming back. But to to speed that up is why we plant there. So it it won't rewild in itself in time to be a function for CO2 capture. That's uh, yeah, that's well probably, said. Yeah. I mean, in the end, nature will come back. Uh, it, it, or it becomes it desert. almost always <laughs> does. Yeah, or it becomes, in this I mean, case, yeah, 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 that's uh, <laughs> that's true. And to stay in Spain, but now switch more to the technical guys on the other side of the table. I mean, how do you have been involved in that project probably from the beginning? What are the considerations when you find a piece of land or even choosing a piece of land looking at the species of these big questions of what to plant, where and why, and and in this case also how, because you have to invent a lot of this machinery actually, because there are not too many hands that can help you. What's the process there that that you personally, but also Land Life Company goes through? Well, we we first start to assess uh, soil and climate. It's uh, sort of the combination of the agroecological zoning that we see, what are the um, challenges we are facing. But we're also looking at the uh, current vegetation. We really like to work with indigenous vegetation and not to introduce species which may become invasive. So from there, you already can work on a short list. And also when you're working in those areas, you also have to look at uh, what landowners would like to have. Because at the end of the day, we'd like to have planting trees which stay there for at least uh, decades and want to make sure that uh, the trees which you're planting will not be cut down prematurely. So we also would like to add trees which have additional value for timber or other purposes, which makes it for the landowners interesting to maintain the trees on their lands. And those are sort of of basic uh, considerations. And based on what Arna has been mentioning on data-driven planting, we are collecting information on which tree species is growing on which type of soil, under which kind of uh, land conditions that we can already select the best species in there, also looking into tree provenances, which are genotypes which are ideally fit to that specific area. And just something on on scale, how many hectares are we talking about here? This is not a few trees on a small piece of land, just in in terms of just to, for the public to have an idea of of size that we're talking about here. We're talking about hundreds of hectares uh, to start off with. And how, how many trees are that? Well, depending on the areas over there, we plant somewhere between 500 to 1,000 trees per hectare, 100,000 trees. And, and when you do the, the, um, the site scouting and the type, do you also look at the carbon potential of the trees? Yes, we do. Uh, Is there a big difference? Because I'm, I'm relatively new to the reforestation uh, sector. What are differences between one type and another one? Sorry, I see, I see Kuhn actually wants to Okay. <laughs> Well, the kind of magnitude is, is huge, clearly, uh, depending on local conditions, water, nutrients, and so on. But sure, at the low end, two, three tons can be stored. Um, two, two, three tons per? Per hectare per okay. year. Yeah, okay, yes, yeah, sir. But there's also quite a large difference in the, in the, um, let's say, in the maximum stock that can be stored there. So we have a growth rate, uh, and, and it can be high, but if the turnover is fast, then the, the total stock um, will not be very high. So the, the advantage of dry and poor areas is that it can have vast stocks. For instance, in Spain, there's, there's this, this home oak system that has uh, used to have a coppice system, a huge amount of carbon still in the roots in the soil. So the above ground is not so high, the growth is not so high, but the amount of carbon that you can store in the system is huge. Okay, can, can you explain that a bit? Because in, you mentioned a number of systems that, that I think we should unpack. All right. 
Yes, but you have, well, surely you have forests and forested systems where the trees grow above ground and the, the faster it grows, the more carbon you, you store. But in the, in, in the long end, let's say that the carbon is more secured in the soil, surely. It's more, most stable. So the carbon storage capacity of the soil is in the, in the end, on the long term, surely a critical component yeah, if you move towards landscape scale restoration. And we need this, this, the scale is really important uh, there. Is one of the components to consider what kind of soil and what kind of different components store not only in rates how fast it accumulates carbon, but what is the attend pool that can be captured there. And Those is are, there a big difference then in types of tree, like the, the type of tree that releases the stores that, or enables this carbon to be stored in the soil? Is that very tree dependent? Yes, yeah, surely, because some trees, I mean, for the harder trees, say if you have home oak, stone oak, it decomposes very, very slowly. So growth rates are very slow, but the decomposition is even much, much less. So at the end of the day, you store then much more of, let's say, the, the, the hardwood trees than if you take poplar or willow and so on. It grows fast, but it's in the this, years. This gone. storage happens when the tree dies and be, is being absorbed by the soil, or it happens through the roots? Both the roots, as, but as well as branches and foliage and, and so on. So that whole system, ecosystem and component is really crucial to take into account and also in, the, in your decision of species choice um, in the local. And another thing, what you mentioned, scale. Scale is really important because you have, you really build in a forest, a kind of forest uh, environment. And the forest kind of creates its own environment in a sense. So tens and hundreds of hectares are good. But at the end of the day, you really need to restore landscapes, catchments. So there you have, let's say, you build a fully functioning system. And then you're not only talking about trees. You, you, you do talk about trees, grasses. And surely the most of the carbon will be stored in trees. But the, the spatial component and how that entire landscape is functioning in combination in what people accept. So the role of people there is surely crucial in what you can promise in the end of the day to customers. It's not only the forest, but the local owners need to accept and feel ownership with what you rebuild. If that ownership is not there, you're really making a kind of, yes, then the develop, if, if in the end of the day, what I often say, if you say hey, there are forests that was just in Nepal and nobody is allowed to use the trees, right? very vulnerable. So in that sense, the, the value of the tree is the value of the match. And with lots and lots of fires there, people put it in fire and it burned because you cannot use it. So that connection to the, to the local people, there's lots of community forest and that landscape for you need to connect it. And then you can really Let's say build landscapes which are established and which are durable in the long term. And, and as you, as, as a company, are moving into landscape scale, how difficult it is, is it to, it's a question for, for three of yeah. you, let's see who, who, who will answer first, but how difficult is it to, to pick the, the places and what to plan where? Like, because it's so vast. And you have so many variables. What, what, what's yeah. the process now? Let, let's ask first, like, when you go into Alaska, what's the process now? Is it very manual? You say it's data-driven. Are there software pieces? Okay, maybe the help? operation, let's say maybe to, to finish on this, let's say, um, ecological component. My, my, hey, what I'm going to bring into one of the elements is, is resilience. And so can we build resilience there? And you said, okay, the, the nature will restore itself. In many cases, it, it will not. And if you have a desertification, as you mentioned, it's drying up, then it is a self-enforcing process. It windles down. And resilience, the ability to bounce back, is that you want to build a forest, a fully, let's say, natural ecosystem, which is all also bouncing back into the forest system. So you want to create this resilience at the landscape scale. And one of the critical elements there is diversity. That is both in provenances which are adapted not only to current conditions but also to future conditions. So that is the challenge. How local do you get um, given 
that the climate is going to change to future conditions. That's an element to, to tackle. What is tree species composition? How do you distribute forest, non-forest and watershed? That adaptive capacity, but in the forest, you want to, to develop at the landscape level. Well, that is, let's say, the, the technical challenge, engineering question. And then you have, let's say, the operational, how to find the areas. Yeah, it, it, here in Spain, a good example is, and, and people often uh, worry about that, but Spain is actually uh, the first European country that really has to deal with decertification. And then everybody thinks Andalusia and the south of Spain, yes, to an extent, but the largest desert in Europe is actually to the northeast of Zaragoza. So pretty much in the northern part of the, uh, of the country. And Spanish uh, government's own figures, there's 10 million hectares of degraded land. Now, degraded can mean different things, and there's different stages to that. But what's that in a, in a percentage of total Spanish agriculture land? Is it 10%, 5, 50%? Cool. cool. That's a difficult question. I will find the details and put it in the transcript <laughs> below. Yeah. It is huge. I think it's... Uh... It sounds huge, but I just have, I have no idea of context here. Try to think of a uh, land area which you can mention afterwards that you say. I, I will put it in yeah. the. I will find yeah, out and put it in the details. Yeah, but for us it means years and years of work. Of just course. just yeah. putting it in simple <laughs> terms. How many trees were that for? <laughs> yeah, Ten million hectares is a lot of trees. <laughs> no, so we we actually worked there with the local uh, government of the largest province, Castilla y León, so Madrid to the uh, northwest, which is a huge area for us, which is good. Uh, there's in place. There's a lot of. Abandoned agriculture land, as I mentioned, so a lot of opportunity for us to plant. It's uh, most of it is publicly owned, uh, which helps us. And there are laws in Spain that uh, protect the forest. So things like you're not allowed to cut a forest. Um, uh, to the Nepal um, example, uh, but here the Spanish government does a good job in discussing with the villages uh, what do we want with this land? Can we plant trees here? Uh, can we also plant uh, nut types, or can we do? Other types of, as Harry always says, you can't eat CO2 uh, credits. So what can we add to the forest? Can there be selective uh, timber? Uh, can we have jobs in the maintenance, in the fire protection, in the fencing, etc.? So there's a lot of debate uh, how you can embed this really with the local population. And then we, we get assigned several pieces of land and then our technology basically takes over, to be honest. So we get uh, several options. And then we use drone and satellite imagery to go back, look at uh, vegetation uh, that is there now, but also what used to be done on the land. Was there agriculture? What kind of fertilizer was used? Was there animal husbandry? What kind of animals? And from there, we, uh, we take soil samples. Very simply, we take soil moisture measurements. And then we come back to uh, uh, the brilliant right, uh, minds on the, uh, on the right of me and to our database, which has um, uh, more than a half a million trees and, and uh, more than probably 40 projects in there. And we look at what type of trees we can plant there. Uh, this is also um, something that you discuss with local nurseries, but you look at the different tree species uh, that we can plant. And then we uh, come up with things like uh, what density do we want to plant? Is it a north facing slope? Uh, so we need a certain uh, species of tree or south facing slope, which has to be more drought tolerant. Is there salinity in the soil? What is the, the density? Do we have to plant in clusters, in lines? Do we need to uh, do key line or contour planting to harvest as much water as possible if there is rain events? Uh, obviously, things like hydrology and, uh, and climate, future climate models. And then Kuhn is uh, also going to be there for the modeling and the simulation because the client in this sense would also be what, what are his objectives? Is it uh, habitat restoration? Is it straight nature restoration? Is it CO2 sequestration or a combination of ecosystem services? And then out comes a blueprint basically of how we want to plant. And then Harry and my job and operations, uh, land life operations job is how fast can we plant that? Because as both of uh, the, the Wageningen mines say, Scale is important and a planting window, as we know, in the northern hemisphere is often uh, spring and fall, but only two months in spring, maybe two, one and a half in fall. And to maximize that, there are um, a mechanization that we have to use. So once we plant, that's the, the last part of this is also the monitoring. So we learn from what we do. Um, we have that, that just to interrupt the, the 500,000 trees you mentioned, the database is your, those are your former projects that you're monitoring 
to find out what's working in terms of setup, scale up, density, type, slope, et cetera, et cetera. You build that in a house, basically. It's your experience of the last years of planting yes. trees. Yeah, so the, the, in general, what you do is you have uh, data like uh, which nursery is a tree from, um, what kind of soil type is there, uh, depends if it's homogeneous or heterogeneous, of, of course, but there are some general um, uh, items that are in the database, but then each tree we uh, have a GPS lock, so a lat long, which is unique for a tree. Then we register the species, obviously, the vigor rating, which is kind of qualitative, but it's a scale of how healthy a tree is. You can look at things like animal damage, branching, length of the tree, the diameter of the stem, and you track that over time. Um, and you can overlay that with a uh, climate model to see what tree has done better. But also things like we planted this type of tree in May but also in February, what happened? What, what is the best period of time to plant that tree? And does it do better on a south facing slope or does it do better in a valley or, or on a slope? Or is it better for erosion or uh, for CO2 sequestration? So all those elements we gather. Um, the first process is just by a handheld device, an app that we developed to register the tree. Yeah, I was going to ask, yeah. how do you do that? Is yeah. it a drone that looks at the, the healthiness of the tree Later on, or yeah. it's... One of you guys that says this one, like manual input into your app, how does, has the data been logged so far? Yeah, ground-based is both. So one is manually, and instead of going in the field with pen and paper, we have evolved uh, through several techniques, but now we have a very simple and quick and very accurate GPS technique on a mobile phone or an iPad. But what we really want to do is, uh, and what we have is on the machine, have a, um, a a system to register that, which would go automatic and faster because you can imagine doing it by hand. You have to go into the field and it takes a while to do uh, thousands of trees. With the drone, that whole game changes. So in-house, uh, we are, uh, so before us are, are, again, the Wageningen Mines, but we also have data scientists and um, a GIS specialist, uh, a map making specialist that are writing algorithms with a drone to be able to capture every tree we've planted. Because at some point, about a meter and a half, two meters high, you can pick up the tree by drone, by photogrammetry uh, technology. And when they're three to four meters high, you can pick them up with satellites. So at some point, the whole planting goes into the database automatically. But the first baseline ground truthing is done by hand still. Very, very interesting. And then... You come to the question, which types of trees, I mean, you, you start to see lines, obviously, but are you at a point yet where you are comfortable at making those decisions? I mean, is your data, data set and time big enough to say, okay, I'm promising or I'm selling this type of, this quantity of CO2 and I'm, I'm fairly confident that we can deliver and the trees are still alive and that, that go, or wh where are you in your, in your journey in that? Again, staying with Spain, and we've planted there since 2016, and in, in, in the northern, northwestern part of the country on a larger scale since 2017, we're fairly comfortable in knowing what species to use, where, what the density should be, and the clusters. But the using machine learning and artificial intelligence on the scale that we want is probably a year to two years out. In other areas, I mean, the goal is at some point... I'm to going to come back in two years to check this, obviously, yeah, because we're very interested in <laughs> who's putting the... Who, who starts answering almost this question of what to plan where and why and, and what kind of supercomputer can we use to at least answer part of that. But I think it, it makes a lot of sense, obviously, you, when your data set is big enough and you start to see lines with the brilliant minds of Wageningen on the other side of the table to, to speed up a lot of things, especially as larger projects come in. But you say one to two years, what's the biggest hurdle at the moment? Is it software? Is it data? It's, uh, well, w one is data, yes. Uh, so the amount of data that we need to do this has to be larger. And especially on the m machine learning side, uh, it's like teaching a computer to recognize a cat on your screen. You need a lot of images. The goal is at some point to be able to recognize a species, the length, the vigor, all from the sky. So you need a lot of data to do that. Um, for now, we're doing that mostly on our own projects. And as we are a young company and trees are not the fastest growers in the world, that simply is a natural uh, system that will take a little while. But as you can imagine, if we do three flights of a field per year, there's a lot of data coming in, especially if it's 150,000 trees in one area. Then it goes relatively fast. So the two years is maybe 
on the long side, because now Kuhn and Harry can go into the database and already determine, you know, certain aspects of what to plant, what not to plant, what to do in the fall, what to do in the spring. So there's already decisions that we take based on the data, but that is growing uh, faster and faster as time progresses and as the amount of data that we capture progresses. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to ask instead of the entrepreneur and the operation guy to the science guys, what do you think is the biggest hurdle to really get to that level to do hundreds of thousands of trees and, and pretty well and accurately predict also with changing climate, like you mentioned before, Kuhn? Uh, and Harry, it's a question to both of you. What, what do you see as the biggest hurdles from your work on selecting these and creating these resilient forests? Surely access to data and available data is, is crucial. And that really is unique. What, what the NF company is doing is to sample this not at, at high detail, not only per, pro, per project, but globally. So that, that means uh, that even with, with short time series, and for the coming years we will have short time series, then we have a huge environmental range um, and a large range in, in climate types, in soil types and in, in treatment types. So because that, that environmental range is, is so huge, you hope and, and to expect that, um, that within years we would be able to give an answer on your question. And surely we can connect what has been done elsewhere. Uh, so there is data available not a lot compared to agriculture or whatever. But surely there are sites which have longer, longer time series where trees have been measured. We can look back in time if we sample trees and core them and do some dendrochronological uh, time series. Which is, what, what does that mean? Sorry? You cut a tree and you, and you look at the tree rings. So how fast has it been growing at a particular site? That can only be done at, a, at not comparable. You don't do thousands of trees there. But at least you get a, a feeling, hey, you can do tens. And you say, okay, this has been growing there so fast. That is the kind of information you already can get. Now, surely for the modeling, it is usually important because without data, you have no use of uh, whatsoever model and no use of whatever brain. You need the data. That's for sure. And another uh, uh, aspect there, is, which is critical, is uh, diversity. As I mentioned, diversity uh, is a kind of risk management approach. So surely we cannot know now which species, which provenance, where to plant and to guarantee growth by so and so much. But we can say, okay, if you have that level of genetic species diversity, maybe at the landscape scale, ecosystem diversity, it's okay. At least the system is able to adapt to those conditions. And then we have a much more solid argument for what it can deliver. And what is also increasingly clear is that biodiversity as such results in higher productivity of the ecosystem. So you can say, okay, this tree is growing fastest, but if you combine, if you have a given diversity of species, then the system as a whole has a higher overall average productivity. So those are then the aspects that, that you can show and bring on the table already now. I want to be conscious of your time, obviously, mm -hmm. and ask a few, a few final questions to the three of you. If there would be one thing, Kuhn, you could change overnight, you have a magic wand, you, you go to the island and say, that I'm going to change X in the agriculture, land use, restoration industry space, what would it be? Where would we wake up tomorrow morning and we'll see what you have changed? You can think about it if you want, if you have something. What, what you need now is to know where you can work, where you can, can um, make, the, the, where you can plant essentially, uh, where you can, are, can and are allowed to change the ecosystems. I think that's, that's also a major operational hurdle. Where is the soil, where is the area available to work on? I think and that, that's an operational hurdle to connect to people and to see, okay, where the projects can start. So a, a list of landowners open to restoration at would be scale, very, very, at scale sure, would be very at helpful. A, yes, at the scale of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of hectares. That is really important then to get to the operational phase at that stage, at that scale. 
I'm going to ask the same question to Hari, obviously. Yeah. Well, I, I really would like to see the, put the trees in purpose for mitigation of climate change, because that's what's really need to address at the moment. And it's a serious problem, and we have to move fast. And that's, I think, uh, what we're after in this company. And to do that, because I think a lot of people are getting on trees against climate change, the, the bandwagon. What would you see, what would you hope, would you like everyone to be on that boat? Would you like every landowner to start planting? Would you like to have a special type of tree that grows faster and stores more carbon? What's your, I what still you have, <laughs> the, the magic computer that answers all your questions? What, what is it? Well, the eight different planting should give that answer, but clearly, like Kun mentioned, we have to look into biodiversity. And there's no one single bullet or not one single tree which can do the trick. But we have to get uh, community involvement here that everybody uh, realizes the necessity of uh, carbon sequestration. And Arno, the same question for you. What would you change overnight if you had all the power? I have, I have the most boring answer, but it would be on the policy side. So there's a lot being done on conservation. Uh, the UN does a lot. But for projects like ours to replant trees, to plant trees, so reforestation and afforestation, there's not a lot of policy around it. And it's difficult to see the direct benefits. There's huge direct benefits that we've listed a lot of here, but financially it's still a stretch. But if we would be able to, for instance, CO2 credits, if you could get ex ante instead of ex post um, Credits and, and it's being worked on, but the EU, for instance, it's difficult to, uh, on the certification side, to uh, make that happen. That would be a real boost for not only land life company, but a lot of companies and potential companies that are trying to start up in this space to be able to do a lot more of these projects. Just worldwide, there's, I think, 14 million hectares of uh, forest still being uh, cut down every year. This hasn't changed since the 80s, I think, since I saw those commercials for the first time in the, in the, in the Brazilian rainforest. Um, I won't get into politics, what is happening there now, but there's still a lot of trees being cut, a lot of mining being done. Um, there's not a lot of trees being planted back, and that should become at least in balance. And obviously, there should be more negative emissions in that sense, or a positive balance to tree planting compared to tree cutting down. So yes, conservation, great, uh, should continue. But um, the area that we are starting up in uh, and we don't have a lot of competitors, I would welcome more and more policy to make that uh, possible to plant more trees. And the final question as the audience, um, let's imagine there's a, a theater full of, of active impact investors that are on the tree bandwagon. They're on regenerative agriculture and food and soil restoration. And what would be, obviously, without giving investment advice, what would be a place mm -hmm. to start? Which books should they read? Which documentaries should they do? Which place should they visit to start thinking about how to put their, their money to work, which could be quite a lot, could be a bit less, but then most of us are also investors through our local banks, etc. Where, where would you start your journey if you're interested in reforestation and the restoration industry? Well, the, the, it's, a, it's a good question. And, and as I said, we, we, when we started the company, we were or not struggling, but debating, do we become a foundation? Do we become a stichting in Dutch or do we become a private company? And what is the business model? And as I said, we moved from making a product towards a end-to-end -end restoration. So it's, it's a good and difficult question to answer. If uh, the easier part is where to look uh, to, to see these kinds of uh, things happening, always I think from satellite imagery is the Dominican Republic in Haiti. Um, the amount of deforestation done in the west side of the island is unbelievable. And from space you just see and all the erosion and water damage that happens there compared to the Dominican Republic is amazing. But there's, I mean, mining sites all over the world where you can see what deforestation does and timber, which is not controlled. So I don't think the public can imagine what the impact is, but I would say try to imagine what the, the, the other side of that impact is. If you go from brown to green, if you have a, a, a brown piece of land and you plant trees there, and you do it in a smart way, what that looks like in five or 10 years. Um, And that is something that is now doable. It's possible. The technology is there to do this. So it will become an industry, uh, what we're operating in, and it will become uh, monetizable, uh, if that's even a word. But it's, uh, I mean, cities now in the U.S. put amounts of money on trees in their streets from a shade perspective, not having to use the air conditioning uh, 
uh, the beautification, and it's always a difficult debate. Is it $500 this oak or $250? But that is becoming more and more commonplace, and I think the same will happen in, in nature restoration, and just the amount that the bills that countries have to pay for hurricane damage, erosion damage is becoming huge, and insurance companies are jumping into it. So I think this is becoming an industry, and it's becoming a money-making industry, and, and really money-making for, for good. It's not just profit for profit, it's making profit off of trees. And I think in a few years, this will be an investable business. And exactly what shape or form, I don't know, but it, I have the feeling that that's going to happen. So definitely keep it on your radar. And going back to the gentleman on the other side of the table, any ideas, books to read, documentaries to watch, places to visit... If you are an active impact investor, because you have seen many places, Harry, I know, where to go to get the best sense. But I, I do think it is seeing places. That is really the thing. I mean, as an investor or as any person, it is really good to do in many, many places. If you go to Africa, which has the, the deforested, where the soil goes into the air, where you see the impact of human there and the consequences of, of human society, then you really understand that something needs to be done there. And I also am convinced that there is a return on investment there. If you put it there, it's on the long term, but if you bring in money and the consequences of return over the longer time, I'm sure that that will be brought back to you. But looking at those sites, and what happened there and what are the potential consequences of not acting, I think that is really touch and feel. And then it brings into you and not in the reports. And with that, I would like to thank you. The three of you is the first time we do a, a live podcast with four people. And I really enjoyed it. I'm definitely going to check in in a year or two years on the software <laughs> and, and obviously on the planting and the hundreds of thousands of trees that you're planting actually this year as well. So I will link a lot of the research and the things and links we've mentioned below. And I want to thank you all for your time today. Thank you. You just listened to an episode about trees. I hope you learned something about the restoration industry and how we might be able to plant millions and millions of productive trees. It won't be easy, but it's absolutely crucial. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees? And what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soil builders and investors in this space. The soil builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc, etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. 
Is this course free? No, this is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning I have no way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you. If this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're gonna look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, uh, what kind of co-investors you could find or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking. Click on the link below, sign up, and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.